Well, hello. I want to get us started um, by thanking, first of all, the Advancement and Alumni Relations team, uh, who is behind the scenes tonight and have done some work to get us started um, with the first virtual community lecture series at the UNM School of Medicine. So thank you to our team. Um, and with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Dr. Helene Silverblatt, who is the Executive Director of the Office for Community Faculty at the School of Medicine. Thank you so much, Ashley, and to Erica and to Ruth for helping us set this up. I want to say that I uh, am a professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences, as well as of family and community medicine at the University of New Mexico School of Medicine. And in that capacity, I also serve, as uh, Ashley mentioned, as the executive director of the Office for Community Faculty. And I, in, I, it, it just gives me tremendous pleasure to welcome so many of you here today for our first ever virtual meeting. I want to thank you for, for joining us for this opportunity to learn together and from each other in a community-based conversation about resilience and self-care under the guidance of one of our distinguished faculty members, Dr. Jeff Katzman. As we all know, this has been a difficult year, full of surprises. Our children pop in and out <laughs> whenever we don't expect them to. Um, and these challenges we've all had to deal with in our own ways. But we also can learn from one another and, to, and we can learn how to support one another. And so by gathering virtually today, we can learn from one another, and that is what we hope to do. And we can, in this way, improve our collective health as individuals, as families, and as communities. The School of Medicine established the community lecture series in the fall of 2015, and these presentations have been brought to life as a way to reach beyond the campus and to bring valuable and useful information to all of us. You are the community we serve, and we are the university for New Mexico. You can watch all of the past lectures online, thanks to the generosity of our partners, the City of Albuquerque Cultural Services Division, which generously and graciously records each lecture. Uh, the School of Medicine hosts two lectures a year, one in the spring and one in the fall. And usually we're able to meet at the beautiful campus of the Albuquerque Academy. But this year, right now, we are unable to do that. But we really appre appreciate our partnership with the Albuquerque Academy, who has really gotten the word out about the, this conversation today. And, um, has, and we've had many people sign up to join us. It is now my pleasure to introduce and welcome Dr. Mauricio Stowen, who is the Distinguished Professor and Chair of the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. Dr. Towen is a dedicated and unflagging uh, um, advocate for community mental health and for community health. He is also an advocate for the uh, Albuquerque Academy community as a daughter who's just started school this semester. And I would like to really welcome you, Dr. Towen, to introduce our, our, our guest speaker today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Silverblatt. Uh, it is my pleasure and honor to be here today and to introduce our, our speaker. As mentioned by Dr. Silverblatt, I am the chair of the Department of Psychiatry, but most importantly, I'm a proud uh, academy parent of a six and a seven year old. Uh, I very much welcome the partnership with the city of Albuquerque and with the academy. So in terms of COVID, we've talked about the first surge and then things got better. And now we have the second surge. But something that we talk probably not as much as we should is the mental health surge. Uh, with this epidemic that is causing a lot of uh, suffering in many different ways, it affects the population in different, in different forms. Anxiety, depression, and in ex extreme cases, suicide. Fortunately, that's uh, a small number of cases, but the rest of us still have to uh, 
face the uh, taking care of our families, our children, our colleagues. So that's why resilience and self-care is so important. As Dr. Silverbrock mentioned, uh, community engagement is something very important for us. In most medical schools, departments have three missions, clinical care, research and education. We have a fourth one, a very important one, and this is community engagement. And that's not only taking care of the community of those who suffer from mental illness, but also education. It's, a, it's education of the community that helps to deal with the stigma of the mentally ill. And also it helps the community in general to deal with uh, catastrophes like the one we're facing now with the COVID pandemic. So that's why the importance of this presentation. <clears throat> we have a great speaker for you. My dear friend and colleague, Dr. Jeff Katzman. He's a professor of psychiatry at the School of Medicine, and he's also vice chair, vice chair of adult outpatient services, education, and academic affairs. He's also uh, recently started a resilience training for first responders with ECHO program. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the ECHO program. He's also a longtime student and teacher of psychodynamic psychotherapy and attachment. And he has, he has received numerous teachers, teaching awards. You will see that how good a, a communicator he is. He has published extensively uh, and um, focusing in the technologies of teaching. He's also currently the director of the Strategic Task Force for the American Academy of Dynamic Psychiatry and Psychoanalysis. One of the passions that uh, Jeff has is uh, improvisational theater and its application to interdisciplinary uh, hospital teams, psychiatric trainees, psychotherapists, and patients. He has presented his work at numerous international conferences and has written two uh, widely acclaimed books and a third one coming to be released in July. Uh, his original research in this pandemic has demonstrated the critical role that improvisation can play in becoming comfortable with the unknown and engage in one's work and life. My dear friend, Dr. Katzman, please. Hey, um, you hear me okay? Thumbs up if I, yes, coming through? Great. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here uh, to speak with you all today. Let me first thank Dr. Silverblad uh, for years of uh, friendship, actually. Um, through everything that, uh, that we've gone through, this being kind of the peak experience for all of us. And I, uh, I appreciate the, the friendship more than I can really describe. And to Dr. Toen, I mean, um, we are in a test of leadership at the moment. And we are very, very fortunate that Dr. Toen is at the helm of our department. I, I don't know um, how this would have gone otherwise and is always thinking two steps ahead and listening um, to all of our input. And um, so to Dr. Toen, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for this opportunity uh, to speak today. And hopefully, um, I, I guess I would want to say off the bat that to say you're an expert in resilience and self-care would be, um, while you're while you're simultaneously yourself in a pandemic, would be a little bit difficult. So I want to just put right out there from the get-go that I'm struggling, like everybody else is, to try to find the best way to take care of ourselves and the people we love. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right, and that's what I'm gonna talk about. In, in terms of the organization of this talk right now, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the sources of psychological distress because they're different um, for all of us, um, but I wanna to try to group them a little bit and uh, to help think about what we can do about it and to consider some potential ideas for self-care and resilience and a few ideas that we can all uh, try along the way. I wanna say that I was given, I think, 50 questions um, up ahead of time, and the questions um, were, were so diverse. One of them was, what is improvisation? Uh, how can that help us in a pandemic? And you know, if, uh, if your child is there, you need to be able to go with it. And now my internet didn't work right at first, and I think we're all improvising right now as we try to struggle with what's going on. I'm just going to um, provide a few quotes from some 
important people along the way. Victor Frankl, I think um, all of us are familiar with, uh, um, was in the Holocaust and wrote his experience about a concentration camp, ultimately um, was a psychoanalyst and, and wrote, everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human, human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. And I think right now we're, we're in very dark time before uh, hopefully some, um, some hope is on the way. And so I think right now it is up to all of us uh, to think about and choose our attitude with everything that we're facing. So I told you I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, the sources of psychological distress and, and that they're different for all of us. I know that some people on the line um, are, are likely faculty here at UNM and are um, or, or um, taking care of patients in various ways or are first responders and are, are facing um, the experience of the pandemic directly and so are facing experiences of exhaustion and, and really stressful situations and, and experiencing some ex acute stress reactions. There is sadness and grief. There is worry about what's going to happen and, and um, how, how do I integrate um, helping other people in ICU settings and then coming home to my family. There is isolation sometimes as a result of that. And there is anger at times and, and a sense of, um, of moral injury um, that we can talk about a little bit later. Uh, we see um, various different uh, scenarios um, in psychiatry when people are talking to us. These are some of the diagnoses um, that people are at risk for, but really a, a stressful situation puts us at risk for most psychiatric um, issues and as well as um, ver a variety of family issues that we're all facing. But some things that, um, that uh, really are beyond our nomenclature that are becoming um, popular to talk about and that we really see are, are these things. And, and the first is compassion fatigue. So what is com um, compassion fatigue? is actually when one is so immersed in, in being empathic and understanding the experience of another person that it becomes difficult um, uh, to, foc to focus on yourself, that there's, there's really an exhaustion as a result of, of such focus on the experience of other people. And burnout is a little bit different. That's when we actually lose a sense of meaning in what we're doing um, and come to question the value of our experience. Caution fatigue, we've talked about, or COVID fatigue, when, when people are just exhausted from um, the precautions that we're all taking. And, and really, complex grief is, is, we're all facing in different ways. Some of us more directly and extensively than others. But for those providing care right now, they're often in a time when they're moving from patient to patient and not, without time to actually process their experience. Just to um, highlight some of these, these experiences. A stress response is really when we've had a stressor, a, a difficult experience, and continually have the experience of repetition in our mind uh, without reminders, that have nightmares or what they call flashbacks of the event. We might be irritable or hypervigilant on, on alert and have difficulty sleeping. We might find ourselves avoiding reminders of the event and having our emotional experience shut down with potentially harmful strategies to cope like substances. And, and grief is um, a hallmark of what we're all dealing with right now. And, and many of us um, are, are aware of situations in which we ourselves or families that we're close to have lost somebody as a result of COVID or people who are providing care to people with, um, uh, with, with COVID are experience the loss of patients, which is very difficult over and over again, um, particularly when we don't have the opportunity to grieve. Um, the other forms of grief though that we're all facing is that our jobs are different. Some of us have lost our jobs. We've lost our routines. Many people were planning to be with family and, and have vacations and um, we're all home. Uh, a lot of us are home a lot, um, doing what we're doing now, we're watching computer screens. And, and some of us have lost contact with our passions because our passions involve getting together. Um, in various ways. Another kind of response to the pandemic ha happens to, to many who have had a, more of an indirect experience where they may not be providing direct care, um, but, but their life has been changed. And their life has been changed in that maybe they're home all day long. 
and don't feel that they're providing care directly. And there may be a sense of guilt or even guilt that actually they're doing okay. They're doing okay right now in these times. I'm gonna talk a lot about detachment and isolation because I think we're all up against that right now, particularly uh, with the holidays coming in. And uh, a lack of meaning um, is really important to struggle with right now. That's what Rick, Victor Frankl talked a lot about. But we all need meaning in our lives and uh, often we're struggling with that right now. A lot of us are alone. I want to talk about that without true sense of connection or the ability to be spontaneous, even in a meeting anymore, um, or e even in a talk like this. Uh, and, and a lot of us have a lot of fear right now about what's going to happen and what could happen. So we don't have great ways to talk about detachment in the psychiatric literature. And there is um, something called alexithymia, which is an old diagnosis, um, but really important. And it, it really does mean an inability to feel um, and, and a sense of being numb and, and may not come really from a trauma like is a symptom of post-traumatic stress disorder, but we just might get to a sense where a state where, where we don't feel much and we have difficulty identifying the feelings in other people. And we may um, lack really much, um, m much capacity to reflect on ourselves and our internal experience. And this entity of alexithymia, we don't have to remember the word, only that it's actually pretty common that in one study of 1,500 people in Toronto, before this pandemic, 20%, over 20% of uh, patients met criteria for alexithymia using the most sophisticated of instruments that measure that, the Toronto alexithymia scale. Um, the prevalence in the general population is seen to be at about 10%, and it's a risk factor for many other psychiatric conditions. Well, alexithymia and, and, and numbness and not feeling is something that many people already experience, but now many more of us are experiencing that. Many more of us are talking about an inability to feel um, and, and that we feel passive and detached. In, in studies of medical students actually around the world early in the pandemic, we were begin, beginning to see this. In a study of 3,000 Italians, um, uh, uh, Mazza and their group showed that detachment was among one of the major variables that became a risk factor for the development of mental health problems. And in a group of Pakistani medical students who were fo forced to quarantine, they too described feeling emotionally detached from family, friends, and fellow students. 23% also felt disheartened, um, and most showed a decrease in overall work performance. Another study in Albania, the rates of depression were quite high as a result of quarantine, and that those rates of depression, um, they varied with the experience um, directly of detachment. A, a little bit different than detachment, but it's kind of cousin is, is really the experience of loneliness. And I, I wanna tell you, I was um, starting to think about loneliness a lot before we ever heard the word COVID and was exposed to this idea that loneliness has become an epidemic. Um, like many epidemics we're facing, loneliness itself is a really um, uh, difficult experience and is pervasive in Western culture. The social psychologists who really studied at Kachopo and Baumeister, uh, they say loneliness has been associated with objective social isolation, depression, introversion, and poor social skills. Our studies have shown these characterizations are incorrect and that loneliness is a unique condition in which an individual perceives him or herself to be socially isolated when among other people. And uh, Vivek Murthy, our, our um, prior Surgeon General and now on um, the, the task force, wrote a, a great book that I would highly recommend called uh, Together, The Healing Power of Human Connection in a Sometimes Lonely World that really goes through this epidemic of loneliness, talking about it as a, a severe risk factor for conditions like heart disease, diabetes, and worsening dementia that parallels smoking about 15 cigarettes a day. Um, it involves an activation of the sympathetic system um, that we're alone and, and we're wired not necessarily to be alone, but if, if, if it becomes chronic, that's when it can really lead to medical conditions. Um, I, being on our own can be really an opportunity for creativity. 
Um, and, and that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the subjective experience of being lonely um, that can lead to withdrawal and depression that we see much more right now when people are at home, um, maybe living by themselves, um, or maybe with just uh, one or two other people. Um, Vivek Murthy also described something that's interesting to think about in terms of concentric circles and that he talked about different kinds of loneliness and that's what we're facing now. So there's, um, we have an intimate circle, many of us, maybe we have a significant other, maybe we have children, maybe we have parents, but we have a group of about, it can't be more than about six or eight who we're closest to. But those are different kinds of relationships than than the middle circle, which he describes as relational loneliness. These are like our colleagues, people we might see every day and rely on to see every day, which is kind of how we define ourselves in the world through these connections. And then we have collective relationships, maybe to greater societies, um, medical societies, or any kind of society that you're in or, or group that you're in, um, so that you may be or maybe um, colleges that we went to, but these are groups of people that we might know all over the country or the world. Right now, we're kind of alone um, with a few people, and I feel like I've seen Dr. Toen quite a bit because we're on Zoom every day, and I have to think in my brain, but I haven't seen Dr. Toen probably, and I don't know how long, in, in real life. Um, and, and that's kind of how we all are, is we don't um, have the relational and collective experiences um, that, that we once uh, had prior to the pandemic. This is extremely stressful um, for our younger students. Um, as many of you parents know, I, I tell parents who are my patients who have young students and elementary school students that I think they are the heroes um, of right now in that it is such a difficult experience to be raising young children and trying to work simultaneously and suddenly being a teacher and an online monitor for kids who need certain developmental experiences that they can't easily have right now. It's not easy to explore um, when you're home with your parents all day. They don't have the same degree of mentorship and in particular, they don't have the same friend groups and that's a very complicated issue right now in terms of exposure to multi-generational homes um, and of their parents. And older students have different kinds of stressors. I have some of those older students who are um, alone in apartments right now in a big city um, and, and they, Older students have financial pressures potentially and that their families um, may not have the finances to um, afford schools that they um, are in. It's, uh, their future is unclear. They don't know if they should go to college online or take gap years or and are burnt out from online learning platforms. They're often socially isolated. Our, our residents rely on having a cohort experience where they're one of, um, for psychiatry, it's, it's one of 10 or 12 residents and they get together and learn from each other, but now they can't really get together in the same way. And I think that's true in most educational settings, the importance of that cohort uh, effect. We have disappearing activities that people uh, can no longer participate in and they don't know when they'll be able to again with difficulty planning the future. And as I said, um, I know of many um, who are alone in apartments in new cities um, with few supports. Families, are quite stressed right now and that it's difficult to gather. Um, it's, uh, there are questions that trust that come up, you know, who have you seen and, and were they wearing a mask and who have you been exposed to? Um, people are home together sharing spaces that we saw right off the bat. Um, and and um, maybe five people are trying to Zoom all at once and internets are suddenly unstable and people say to exercise, but gyms are closed and activities are shut down and there's nowhere to go. And people are trying to work and and raise their kids and teach simultaneously. And we have a lot of concern about older people in our families. And many of us are experiencing losses and grief um, without really people to talk to or, pro or a way to process that. And many of us feel really a strong need to have an adventure, to go somewhere, to break this up, because this has been many, many, many um, months that we hadn't, um, we hadn't expected. I want to quote um, Masaru Emoto from The Secret Life of Water as I transition into how we can take care of ourselves. Um, it says, if you feel lost, disappointed, hesitant, or weak, re return to yourself, to who you are, here and now. And when you get there, you will discover yourself like a lotus flower in full bloom, even in a muddy pond, beautiful and strong. So probably you've seen many people 
talk about self-care with a long list of all the things that you're supposed to do for yourself. And one of the questions that came in is, do I have to do this every day, this self-care? Yes, we have to think about it every day. And when we don't, uh, we, we generally feel worse. Um, so some things to think about right off the bat is, are that we have to take all the recommended precautions. And we feel better actually when we do that, when we're not taking unnecessary risks, particularly now when the holidays come. But those recommendations, they lack clarity. Back to PPE and what we were supposed to be wearing or when people are supposed to be quarantining and testing, it's like a moving target sometimes and people can get very frustrated. In, in general though, we need to structure our day. Uh, we, it's not a good thing to get out of bed, roll in your PJs from a, um, with PJ bottoms on, um, but, but uh, maybe uh, a tie up top. Um, we, we need to get dressed to, and go to work. Do whatever you can to tell your brain you're going to work before you get on that computer and then you've got to get off it at a certain point because it's more intense now. We used to be able to walk from meeting to meeting, but now they all go an hour and you go into the next meeting. And, and the other day I saw that I had 280 steps total for the day and I was kind of aghast, which is it's the next part. We have to exercise. Um, but as I said, it's not easy necessarily to find ways to do it. We have to avoid getting the COVID-19 as people talk about and, and um, just eating while we're home with uh, kitchen access. And, and we need to try to get good rest and sleep. There are studies that show getting into nature and seeing water are very, very helpful. Um, so, so when you need a break, we are in a place um, where, where there are some opportunities to do that. And I'm going to talk a little bit about emotional regulation and relationships and the importance of finding meaning in our lives. Um, we need to try to have calm and transparent conversations with each other to honor our genuine emotions and find people in our lives to validate that, to limit the news, to find projects and hobbies that give us passion if they're helpful, to find our own physical space, to take walks when we can. Um, and most of all, um, if, if we're home on Zoom, we need to uh, identify the experience of passivity and fatigue um, as it might be overcoming us and, and try to do something about it. Many of us are in positions where we have anxiety. We have anxiety at work. Um, if, if we're working in situations where we're caring for people um, and don't know if we're putting our, ourselves at risk, this is a, a longstanding concern that healthcare workers have had who are providing direct care. And, and a lot of us worry about our parents who might be in another city uh, um, that we can't can no longer see and we can find ourselves getting anxious and worrying and and it can be like a loop so what i can suggest about this is to make a plan and to write it down here is what i'm going to do about these questions so that rather than actually thinking about the same questions over and over again it's a good idea to interrupt yourself and look at your plan well this is what i said that i was going to do when i start to feel uh, these worries um, because when we go over the same worries over and over again it doesn't necessarily help us and, and when we get overwhelmed with anxiety, there are um, a lot of things that we can do um, that, to help manage that. And many of you know these techniques already. I, they're just um, here and I can't in a 40 minute talk go through them all. Uh, a, a nice one though is, is um, so, so alternative nostril breathing just literally means to breathe in through one nostril and then out. And, and then the same with the other nostril. Our alternate mouth and nose breathing means um, is, is very, very helpful. And to just run through it very quickly, you would breathe uh, in through your nose and out through your mouth, and then in through your nose and out through your nose, then in through your mouth and out through your nose, and in through your mouth and out through your mouth. It doesn't really matter the order. Um, the idea is that you become more focused on your breathing, which takes uh, is, is a grounding experience. Abdominal breathing, um, getting a sense of presence in which we name five things that we see, and then we name five things that we hear and name five sensations that we're having is also very helpful. Um, various meditations um, can be very helpful. Visual, visualization and guided imagery, particularly of a place that you know has been a resource um, where, where it's kind of your feel good place. That's a, that's a, a very good um, experience to know in your mind. Um, there are various ways um, to calm oneself in terms of abdominal breathing and progressive muscle relaxation. And there are awesome apps um, available, and, and those are really nice. Uh, I like one that's called Simple Habit. Um, I, um, in, in that there's, I think, 100,000 different 
five minute tapes that you can uh, listen to and you can pick the person's voice that you like and they'll take you on a little adventure and you don't have to do anything. So it's very, you can feel very taken care of um, through some of these apps um, while learning to calm down. If actually you have very long uh, shifts, it's important actually um, to do um, what's called 50-10, though not easy, um, to work 50 minutes and then take a break um, rather than to um, keep going and going and going and in that break. Um, what's recommended is to actually stretch to the ceiling um, to um, do abdominal breathing and to hydrate. I want to talk about relationships and think about different sets of relationships that we all have. It's a really good time right now to think about friendships all that you've had over the course of your life um, currently and far away and to think about reaching out to people uh, to make a time to connect um, even on the phone or or um, with a with a um, chat uh, to message them, um, maybe to Zoom them, though that can be pretty tiring, and to even sometimes make a spreadsheet. These are all the people I want to contact and I want to stay in touch with. Um, we, we can actually be conscious about it, and that can be um, a, a really helpful thing to do. Um, with our parents, who are, if we're not with them, um, it's a good thing to check in with them. Um, it's a, there's a possibility uh, to build those new connections and to get creative about how to connect with people who are far away from us and, and to think about what are some positive experiences that we really cherish with our family of origin and how can we connect um, more to that. Um, when we have kids at home, as I said, I think this is extremely difficult. And most of all, I come from uh, the, the world of attachment research um, where really the most important metaphor is one of a secure base. Um, that we are a secure base for our children. And, and that's um, in the middle of a, a pandemic that none of us would have anticipated. That's really our role more than anything else is to be able to be there for our kids with curiosity about their lives, uh, their friends and their potential passions and to make room um, for their feelings and to, to find some non-Zoom experiences we can have together, um, some ways to adventure and and really to help us all right now realize we're, we're likely in maybe the darkest, but maybe um, uh, a later chapter of what's going on. And we do have a sense of hope um, if, if we can get through this right now. And we need to be very cognizant that that's where we are right now. Um, for those of us with a, uh, a spiritual practice, it's very, 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 very helpful. And it's a helpful time to think about that um, right now if we've, uh, if we're not connected to that, this is, a, this is a nice time to actually start wondering about that. We're in close quarters with the people that um, we love, those of us who are living with um, significant others. Our emotions can be fluid and we need to be able to, to follow some rules of what we call collaborative discourse. Um, so we don't wanna, when we're talking to one another, we wanna think about saying a yes and not but, um, or and not you always do this and I always do that and you never do this. Um, we, we, if we wind up in an argument, we want to stay with one issue at a time, and we want to be able to think about our partner and, and even repeat out loud what's going on for them and what is their state of mind so we can come to some um, empathic common ground and, and really develop more of what is there that is positive um, that can be emerging right now. In a recent study of people in relationships, it was determined that, that actually flexibility was the most important thing um, to those who were doing well in their relationship. And, and um, those components involved being open to experiences, good or bad, um, being mindful of the present moment, experiencing thoughts and feelings without obsessions, thinking broadly about things um, while connected with deeper values and taking a step uh, toward the goal, um, any, any kind of goal. Many of us have things to be angry about. Um, that would be a whole nother talk, all the things that we could be angry about. But when we are, it's really important right now um, uh, to take a pause, maybe a walk, like I said, get into nature, to distract yourself if you need to, to do something positive with the en energy of anger, and also to spend time with the feeling and what the experience is like. And maybe even um, think about the limits and boundaries of, of um, what we've all taken on and is there some are we extending ourselves a little bit beyond um, what we're capable of 
Uh, it's also important uh, to remember a lot of us um, right now are at home and have this fear of missing out. I, I just, it's important to remember there's not a lot going on right now. Um, and, and so um, I, I know of people who, are, who, who this really um, is, is a, a big stressor. And it's also really important that most people aren't doing fabulously right now. A, a lot of us have difficult feelings right now. And, and so it's important to kind of know that is the, the response that I think is appropriate uh, to a pandemic. Um, and, and we need to find times and ways to connect with each other. We need to find sources of meaning. And, and most of all, uh, we need to be able to feel. Um, so most everyone probably knows uh, who's tuned in to hear me probably knows Brene Brown and from Rising Strong, she says, people who wade into discomfort and vulnerability and tell the truth about their stories are the real badasses. And I, I want uh, to uh, also read a, a quote that I like from someone uh, named Jay Michelson who wrote a book called The Gate of Tears, who said, as someone who's experienced depression at times in my life, I feel qualified to say that sadness is not the same thing. Depression is a medical condition, a function of brain chemistry, and can be crippling, devastating, and bleak. It makes it hard to live one's life. Subjectively, I experience it as a dullness, a kind of lessening or graying of all emotion. Sadness, on the other hand, is part of being human. So is loss, pain, and loneliness. They all have their own hues and characters. And unlike depression, sadness does not worsen when one yields to it. It softens and teaches and makes way. And in the yielding, is some of the quality of liberation itself. A lot of us have difficulty getting to our feelings right now. So we have to think about ways to do that. Music we've heard over our life that reminds us of people or, or um, somebody told me about actually they like to sing a certain song in the shower. But music is really important to bring into our lives right now as is writing and being mo uh, vulnerable with people that we trust and so important to try to talk to someone. And that is in the world of, uh, Pooh and Piglet in the house of Pooh Corner. Piglet sidled up to Pooh from behind. Pooh, he whispered, yes, Piglet? Nothing, said Piglet, taking Pooh's paw. I just wanted to be sure of you. For those uh, who are running teams, um, there are many models to build resilience um, on the, the teams that we belong to. Um, it, it's generally best not to bring in someone like me to a team um, because people, trust each other on a team and they need to be able to talk with each other and they know what their life is like and so if you can build in check-in processes on your team that's better uh, usually than bringing in somebody external to whom a relationship needs to be built as well um, there are many models of such uh, peer support programs the one i really like to hear about was uh, out of uh, the university of minnesota the battle buddy program in which uh, modeled on the military they have a, um, a buddy system in which people check in and the beginning and the end of each day with, and people know that they have a buddy. So in life, that's not a bad thing um, to know who you're buddy with or, or at work or to think about who are you checking in with or is there a way to have a similar system um, in, in a program that you might run. There are certainly techniques that are valuable to learn. Um, psychological first aid is probably the most important. Um, those are actual guidelines that are learnable uh, when we come across somebody who's, who's really in need of our help, if we're, for example, working in a disaster, um, or if you're working, for example, in the hospital and you come across a, a coworker who's really not having, um, who's having difficulty with their emotion. The basic premises of those are to establish safety and a sense of calm and to restore somebody's self-efficacy and sense of connection and hope. Here are some links. Um, to actually, if you wanna do the online training and, and a field guide, um, that's something that, um, that people can uh, sign up to do to learn the psychological first aid core strategies. These are the core strategies. Um, we make contact and engagement with people. Um, we make sure they're safe. We try to stabilize the situation and gather information that we can use um, for practical assistance. We try to connect people with social supports and provide information on coping that they feel might be helpful um, and try to link people with collaborative services. That's the general model of psychological first aid. Um, a big developer of this is um, George Everly who worked with us on our ECHO program. And he said something uh, that he wrote in a kid's book um, that I really took to, um, which was a revision of the golden rule when he said, treat others as they would like to be treated. Um, and that, was, that um, gave me something to think about. 
as a revision of the golden rule and really the, the development of our curiosity and perspective taking right now. I'm gonna skip there in the uh, name of time. I wanna talk a little bit about um, another source of detachment and disengagement that we, many of us feel, which is this idea of Zoom fatigue. Um, as I said, um, so to prevent, so I think it's real and it's actually be, um, written about now in the literature and some strategies when we're um, finding that we're losing ourselves in the virtual world, as I said, is to sort of structure and limit the day. Um, those things I've talked about. Also to move and to stretch and to walk between sessions, not just click from one link to the next to the next, and to actually look around the room um, to remind yourself that you're actually in a physical environment. Um, and I talked about the 50-10 rule. It's also helpful for a lot of people to reduce the glare uh, on their computers and to get a blue screen or to use eye drops and to do blinking exercises. Even that there was a study that was released actually that people who spend the day online have much um, less tear production um, than they otherwise would. So um, taking care of ourselves in that way is, uh, is really important. Also really important if, you're, if you can, particularly if you're talking to just one other person, to turn off self-view um, because uh, another study looked at um, um, how people felt after looking at themselves on Zoom um, after an hour and actually they didn't feel great. So if, if you don't have to get distracted by seeing yourself, it's helpful. It can be a little challenging when you're in a group, you can feel like, where am I? But we don't generally look at ourselves when we're in a group and that's part of what contributes to Zoom fatigue. I also need to really embrace it as a, as a way that we can connect, that we can be there, and we need to lean into the um, to the paradigm as um, much as we can, which means um, it's not helpful to you ultimately when you're also answering emails or looking at your phone when you're actually on a Zoom call. Just because other people don't, can't necessarily see you, it actually drains you of energy to be doing that. Um, and we can also think about other ways to communicate, like phone and text and email, um, to actually vary it up so we don't have the day like I had, which um, of 12 straight hours of Zoom calls, which is not good uh, for anybody. We have to think also, I know there's likely some teachers on the line, how do we teach best um, when we're using Zoom? And I've probably broken the rule now already in that we can't really concentrate for more than 20 or 30 minutes max. Um, and there's information that is coming out about that and colleges are beginning to alter online curriculum to reflect that. Um, uh, there are some developments of Zoom that are worth keeping up with as we update the profile, like you can actually move your Zoom box now, and now you can have 50 people on a page if you want. Um, but um, if you're presenting, it's a good thing to start with some way to connect, um, some question in general for the group so that people can actually feel connected before you get to the task. Um, if you're teaching, um, you want to uh, think about if people should have cameras on and off. It's very difficult to teach to the heart of darkness, I call it. Um, and and um, used to actually teaching with a lot of um, collaboration in a workshop setting. So we want to tell people to turn their cameras on, but also realize it's difficult for people to be seen with their cameras on all day long. So this is something to think about. Um, and if we're Zooming with our family and friends, like let's have a Zoom call with our family, it's also difficult to not have a structure to that. Um, and to just be on with 20 people and we don't know who's leading the call and people can get off feeling worse. So sometimes it's good to think about the structure of that and some questions and games. Uh, I, I have done a lot of improvisational theater in my life that's now gone completely virtual and online. And, and there are a lot of improvisational games um, that, are, uh, that are helpful. One that is really nice is to um, ask people um, to reach uh, and find something on their desk um, and, and to um, give it as a gift so that I would give this glass egg, for example, to Dr. Silverblatt, um, because it is um, uh, so so um, uh, so clear. And, and that's what I appreciate with, um, about you, Dr. Silverblatt, is, is your clarity and, and how transparent you can be. Something like that. And you go around um, uh, with experimenting with that. We do things like telling one word story at a time or telling stories that we all add on. Um, we interview each other as if we're going to play each other in a movie, so we get to know each other. These are, are various ways, um, even with a mirror game, um, that people can actually connect and feel that they're connected um, with one another. I'm going to end with some holiday tips here. Um, you know, in general, 
psychiatrists see more people during the holidays. It's not a time actually, it's a time where people can feel badly um, in the first place, alone and isolated. Um, and now um, that's just magnified. And it's really a time where we have to consider the risks of gathering very carefully. Um, and because we want to be able to gather with each other next year. So we have to think of, are there some creative ways to gather in meeting, meaningful ways virtually or outdoors? Or what could that look like? If we have some virtual meetings, uh, parties together, there are actually online virtual hosts that will host a party for you, a ski chalet and various things. Um, or, or, or there are various um, questions um, that we, we can ask each other, like what's your favorite holiday memory? You can come up with, with lots of, of questions that can provide structure um, to a Zoom call rather than kind of we're going to Zoom on um, Christmas Eve with no structure um, to it. And I'd, I'd appreciate as um, I'm living through this, as I said, with all of you, if you've come up with great holiday stuff to do, please um, add that to the chat um, as well. Um, yeah, these are just some questions that you can ask your favorite holiday memory. Um, is there a present you wanted that you never got um, or your favorite holiday um, tradition? your most memorable or wild holiday memory? Um, or what do you want to be different about yourself when we're no longer in a pandemic? And I will end uh, with some words from the Velveteen Rabbit, uh, actually, that I can turn to recently uh, about being real. Um, and, the, and the skin horse said to the Velveteen Rabbit, it doesn't happen all at once. You become, and it takes a long time. That's why, that's why it doesn't happen often to people who break easily or have sharp edges or who have to be carefully kept. Generally, by the time you are real, most of your hair has been loved off and your eyes drop, drooped and you get loose in your joints and very shabby. But the things, these things don't matter at all because once you're real, you can't be ugly except to people who don't understand. But once you are real, you can't become unreal again. It lasts for always. Um, so there are resources that I have in the uh, um, PowerPoint. Maybe we can make this available. Um, uh, I'm not sure how to do that, but we, went, we can talk to our doctor. We have EAP and peer support um, so programs in our, where many of us work. There are national suicide prevention hotlines, a New Mexico crisis line, a disaster distress hotline, uh, which can be very um, helpful in terms of talking in the moment as well as getting resources. There are also staff development resources. Um, this is a list to help staff um, become savvy about how to work um, in these difficult times. Yeah, so. I will stop share and Ashley, I'll hand it back to you. Well, Dr. Katzman, I just want to make sure that I say thank you so much on behalf of the advancement and alumni relations team at the School of Medicine, um, as well as uh, from the community at the academy. I also have um, children just like uh, Dr. Toen who attend the academy and, and we really appreciate you making yourself available during this challenging time uh, to give us some tips about how we can be more resilient and how we can take care of ourselves. Um, we, we think it's valuable and, and definitely has been helpful to me. I know that the others watching agree. So thank you so much. I want to uh, remind everyone who's watching that uh, we're going to move now into a question and answer session. Thank you to those of you who uh, submitted questions ahead of time. As Dr. Katzman mentioned, he already tried to answer as many of those questions as possible throughout the lecture. However, we have a couple that we received ahead of time that we are going to ask live, and that gives you all time to go ahead and use the question and answer um, capability here, the Q&A uh, down at the bottom of your screen to go ahead and ask some questions. We have a, um, a polling system where if you ask a question and um, others agree that that's a great one that they would like to see answered live here, you can like that question and that'll be moved up to the top of our list. Um, I also want to remind you all that if you um, want to review this, we are recording the session, so we're going to post that to the website at the School of Medicine. Um, and we'll also be providing a, 
a resource for you all, which will include all of the links that Dr. Katzman shared today, um, as well as the responses that he provided, both to the questions that he answers live, as well as those questions that we're not able to get to. Um, as he mentioned, you know, there's no right answer for some questions, so we're gonna do our best to pull from the resources at the School of Medicine, at the UNM um, broader, uh, UNM resources as well and try to answer as many of those questions as we can and we'll be sending to all of the attendees and registrants a, uh, a summary of the lecture responses so look out for that and if you wanted some of those links that Dr. Katzman shared those valuable links we'll be providing those to you afterwards so Dr. Katzman I'm gonna go ahead and move into um, this response question and answer time um, before we get some and we had questions that you already received, one of which was, do you have any suggestions for parenting burnout? Now, a very interesting question for me to get after having my child come in. This is exacerbated by having children at home all the time now, doing virtual learning and childcare options that are non-existent. What are some strategy, strategies for student parents and working parents with children. Yeah, so like I said, I, I think uh, this is really a difficult question and situation to be parenting through this. And I think that people who are parenting young, young children um, ought to receive a trophy. Um, I, I just think it's very, very difficult and anything that I say is gonna fall flat. Um, to anybody's individual circumstance. And I just want to say that right off the bat. Um, I, I think it, it's a time to get creative and to wonder what is the best solution here? What is the best way to, um, to reach this child? This isn't working or we're exhausted. We need to break the frame. So we need to figure out how to do something a little different. We need to figure out an adventure. We need to, um, and, and, and so the things that I think are the most important are that parents actually have ways to connect with each other or with people that they trust about the feelings that they have so that they can continue to actually be a secure base for their kids. Um, that, that, that's really critical. And, and if we are, then we can continue to be curious about our kids and what's helpful and what's not and wonder about them. Um, th those are the most important strategies. We, I, I can't also imagine although I hear about it, what it's like to actually uh, be a student now and not be able to play your sport or to dance or to, or to go to college or do it in a mask um, alone in a dorm. It's just all really difficult. Um, so as I said right in the get-go um, with, with Victor Frankel's idea, we need to, act, we can choose our attitude about it really and realize that we're burnt out, that this is too much and we need to take care of ourselves and we gotta figure out how to do that so that we can actually be there the best that way that we can um, for our kids. I, I also think we can get into ruts and routines and any way that we can think of to indu introduce some sense of play, um, uh, some sense of um, collaboration with our kids is, uh, is really important. Thank you. I really, uh really like that portion of the presentation where you talk about play and you give us some ideas for uh, how we could possibly uh, play with our family on Zoom. You know, I do a lot of our meetings with my family on Zoom and sometimes it's a little unorganized and strange. So I think I might try those. Um, we received a second question here. What is a healthy balance of checking on the health of others as well as my own? My husband and six grown children are tired of me checking in on them. Yeah, so whoever is asking that question already has a great, um, a, a great sense of themselves on, in, um, in, in some way, because just to be able to think about that, um, to think about the need for balance is, is great. And it's gonna shift every day. Um, sometimes our kids, our grown kids need us more than they do at other times. Um, um, and in those times, it's more difficult to focus on ourselves. But when we find ourselves um, depleted, I think it's really important to, to focus even a little more on what we need, on what we've given up, 
on what we're missing, on music we're not hearing, on everything that um, has, has kind of gone by the wayside so that we can be there. Um, you know, people talk about a work-life balance and it's never a number. It's not like I'm at a six or something like that. It's not like a Richter scale or something, but so it's hard to um, put into a concrete answer other than to say, um, thinking about balance and, and thinking about, okay, um, right now I'm overloaded for my six grown children and they need me and that's what I'm gonna do, but I have to um, also think about how I'm um, considering myself and, and do they really need me? Um, or um, do, I, do I need me to, too? Do I also need me? And I need to find a way to take care of myself. In this third question, um, you may have listed some of the resources in your presentation, but if you wouldn't mind going back through that, um, this person asks, might there be resources for Zoom method fellowship groups of various categories available to join in or inquire about um, in the follow-up to the presentation, she says, or he says, that they have a college-aged young man at home who's not currently resuming studenthood and, and they need that fellowship. Yeah, so um, here's what I wanna say about that. Um, the good thing about being virtual is that we can do all kinds of things that we never could have done before. Um, we can be, we can attend trainings, we can be in, um, uh, services with a spiritual organization that's in Minnesota. We, we can um, be participating in a museum um, group with a specific activity. What we need to do um, is actually figure out what is it that I've always wanted to do and know about? Is it um, speaking a certain language? Um, should I take a class? Is it, is it um, but what is the passion? And, and that really ought to um, guide. Um, if it's um, so, so I think that's the most important. I don't know personally of um, just Zoom groups. Um, I, I think that they tend to come um, through um, libraries and museums and spiritual organizations and, and training opportunities um, and um, service organizations. And, and I think those are the things that people really need to think about and start ex exploring. Like, oh, this is a time when I can actually do this. For me, I'll just say on a personal level, there's no psychoanalytic institute really other than the Jungian Institute in New Mexico, but I can actually reach those courses all over the country now, all over the world. Um, so that's just one sliver of an example. So if somebody's a, a historian around a specific period, they likely can take a, a course that maybe they couldn't have taken here, for example. And there are courses here, of course, um, uh, through our continuing education um, and, and I think those are also, this is a really wonderful time um, to do that. Uh, yeah. Learn to cook if you love it, if you don't, and cook some more if you love it. Um, whatever, whatever, whatever it is. Awesome. We got a really great question in the um, chat and the question and answer tool um, from someone from the Academy community. And the question is, I think a great one. What do you anticipate might be some challenges of re-entry when we finally find ourselves able to start integrating back into normal life as a society for kids and adults? Yeah, um, you know, I asked Dr. Toen that this morning um, about our just our clinic and what that would look like. Um, I think we're all going to have to think about that in very careful ways as people are vaccinated on different schedules and um, we're not used to being with each other um, live um, so much. It's um, almost like we uh, being live with people is uh, something that's atrophied a little bit. So I, I don't know what everybody's individual biggest challenge will be. I, I know that for some people, this is actually um, being kind of on your own without much going on is sort of a relief um, from all of the stuff that happens for all of us that's kind of the opposite of this, all of the kind of manic energy that one can have to have to go here and um, go to this thing and that course and all, all different activities and be busy. So I anticipate that um, as we've been less maybe busy um, in, in life, it's gonna, it's gonna be a re for us about how, how do I balance what I 
want to do and get in a car and go to, for example, and I don't. That's just my first, my first thoughts about that. Yeah, I'm sure we'll see a, a wide variety of, of new struggles that'll come along so, as we get back yeah. into it. I also think that we are all struggling with um, some, some very deep questions right now. And so many people are not going to want to do things that, that feel irrelevant, um, that, that don't feel relevant to who they are, um, to their life. Um, and so where people might have taken things on in the past, I think it's going to potentially be more difficult um, um, to take some of those, those um, things on because um, I, I think we're all yearning for meaning right now and want to be involved in meaningful activities. Well, surely the things that you've shared today will help us with those challenges when they come as well. So thank you. Um, we've got another um, viewer here who's asked a question. It, is it helpful to focus on the fact that we must first accept the new normal that's being in the circumstances that coronavirus has brought on and how to find balance within it since there's so much uncertainty? Um, is first accept acceptance key? Yeah, that's a great question and a great idea. I think it is. I think um, if we don't accept um, the reality of our situation, then we get into all kinds of trouble. And that's kind of what I meant when there's an acceptance that's required almost that none of us are particularly happy at the moment necessarily um, or, or feeling great. And it's helpful actually to realize that and to, to realize the context that we're all in. So um, if we realize uh, we're in a once in a century, hopefully, um, pandemic and that we're isolated and that we can't see our family and that the holidays are coming um, but that we don't want to get sick or get people sick that we can we have to be able to accept those things in in order to um, have a starting place for creativity really and for the emergence of actually small ideas uh, to help us all get through this And we have a question that I'm sure many are uh, thinking to themselves. Um, how do you consistently say no and kind of protect yourself over and over again? What are some tips for, for having the strength to do that? Yeah. Model the people who do it well. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, and when somebody finds it really a, a, a good way to do that, uh, let me in on the secret. I, I think it's really complicated because I think we all want to do what we can um, to help situations or to, and, and um, particularly if you're in the world, you want to be able to, um, to take things on. And sometimes we don't know that we've taken on a little too much until um, our, we start getting signals from our own emotions and our own bodies. And so it's really becomes about paying attention to those signals and realizing, I think I've taken on a little too much here. Um, and then I think, the one good thing about getting older is um, is um, some wisdom sometimes comes. And so sometimes we can know, no, I've done this before and I get in trouble when I take um, this much on or where I take this kind of thing on and maybe this isn't for me and I really need someone else to, to take this on. I think also if we approach the world though, saying no with boundaries, um, then then sometimes we wind up alone and isolated because we haven't let ourselves um, get in the mess of being a little over involved. Um, and there's always ways um, out of it, but sometimes we can shut ourselves down um, by being so overly concerned with our boundaries. That's just my bias about that. Sure. So someone asks here, what are strategies for talking to young adults who are pandemic weary about the topic um, and how to encourage them to take on that self-care and resiliency. You've given us some tips, but do you have strategies for how we can encourage others to take your advice? Yeah, great question. I would love to see in the chat what people are doing um, with that. I think this is a particularly dicey time in that people are coming home. Um, so we've all adjusted to, um, uh, to the situation over the many months, but kids are coming home from college um, right now. And now they're maybe seeing old friends and coming home. I think the rules are all kind of changing. Um, and if somebody sees an old friend, is that, is that, what does that mean now? We all have to almost think about it again, more actively what we had thought about many months ago, really during the holiday season and have some, I think, 
um, willingness to have frank conversations because it's, um, it's, it's such an important time right now. And I, I think underscoring, and this is what I said before too, underscoring for kids that, you know what, we're in, we're in the last chapters here. Um, we're, we're, maybe we're in the seventh, eighth or ninth inning here. We, we, you know, we don't want to get sick now um, be before there's an opportunity for vaccination. So I think underscoring the importance that the times are really difficult right now. The viral counts are very high right now. Um, people are exhausted right now. This is a dark time. And so we have to be really careful in order to get to a lighter time. And I think kids um, can get that, that we're all really struggling with something that's not easy right now and is actually um, sort of worse than ever, but maybe bef um, um, before we're, we're at the time before things get better. But of course, kids can feel like I I've waited long enough, you know? So I'm, I'm not, I don't want to give some adv advice that's um, necessarily easy. I know, I know this is difficult. But, uh, let me say one more thing about that too, is that I think um, it's difficult for siblings. Um, siblings can have different ideas about what is safe, what is not safe, um, um, uh, that can cause all kind of family stuff about um, did, you know, who they are seeing or not seeing. Um, and so I, I think um, trust in families and honesty is just really important right now um, with some transparent conversations. Dr. Katzman, I know many of those who tuned in with us today are educators, some of them at, you know, um, elementary or middle and high school level, but many are um, like yourself teaching students who are in maybe medical school or graduate students, postdoctoral fellows even. Um, and we got a question ahead of time that said, how can we help our trainees have a better outlook about the future during this difficult time when jobs are limited? Um, and COVID has kind of exacerbated that. Yeah, I, I think when those kind of questions come to us, it can feel like the weight of the world is on our shoulders. Like I have to fix, we have to fix this now um, in, in what can feel like an unfixable situation. Like a, 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 it's horrible, right? I, I mean, um, people want to be in college or in medical school or wherever they are um, and, and with the cohort of other people they're training with, but they're learning um, a skill in, in boxes virtually and can't be with each other. Um, so my advice about this is to just really get curious with um, the people that we're training, like what would make this better? Um, what, what do you think you, um, we could do about this training experience to actually help? Um, because our ideas usually aren't right um, for, for our trainees and they, um, and we can wonder with them, are you getting together or not? Or, uh, or how is it, how is it going um, for you guys? And I, I think the question of the job prospects um, is one that's probably beyond me. Um, and I just think it's also really difficult, but also involves frank conversations and brainstorming about um, what the fears are, what the worries are, what actually is reality um, in terms of, of job, job prospects. You know, I, I read more people are going um, into medical, applying to medical school now as a result of this than, um, than ever before. So um, I don't know what that means actually in terms of, um, I, I think that the economic dynamics are so complicated that it's, it's hard to know that. Well, thank you for taking a stab at some of those questions that maybe are a little out of the scope, but definitely give us an idea about, you know, some of those anxieties that are out there, um, no matter where we're at. And I do want to second what you said, you know, Dr. McGrew, our Dean for the School of Medicine has mentioned that admissions applications for, the, for medical schools across the nation are up by 17%. Mm -hmm. So maybe the jobs, you know, don't look like they're there, but we do have a broad community of individuals who want to help even though there's the the pandemic and they want to get into the medical field anyway so that's encouraging <laughs> yeah. um, we got a question here dr katzman do events like this pandemic or possibly natural disasters create a psychological change to the masses do you think this is going to cause people to be more resilient or more cautious anxious worried or both yes they do um they cause generational effects. We named generations after this, gen this, gen that. Um, and we have people in our 
department that work with Dr. Silverblatt, who are um, really some of the experts. Um, um, Maria Braveheart on, on transgenerational trauma and, and the impact that lingers um, for these traumatic events. Um, I, I think um, you, can, you can kind of look at some of the great disasters of our time um, and, and there is psychological literature about um, the experience of being a child of a survivor of parents who've gone through, for example, Holocaust or various experiences. And um, so that's a, um, it's a complex question with a, I think a, a deep literature. And the answer is yes, um, the masses are impacted um, by things that have happened and things, um, things shift and we shift. And I think it is toward resilience on some level if we are resilient. Um, and it can also be toward um, detachment. It can also be toward avoidance of things or of our feelings or of being with each other. And the last thing we would want to learn from this pandemic, for example, is that we are good isolated from one another. Um, that's probably the most important thing that I could say. Well, as I ask this uh, final question that was submitted ahead of time, I want to encourage anyone who is still watching to go ahead and put your questions uh, in the question and answer function or chat um, to respond to Dr. Katzman as far as what you're doing right now. He really would love to hear from you all and, and we'd love to share that with everyone else who's attending in our summary. Um, but as I ask the, the final question that we received ahead of time, I want to encourage you to use the chat. Um, so the question here is about how, and I think it's a good one to end on, how often do we need to focus on being resilient? It's a big thing, um, but is there, you know, um, a time <laughs> line or, or how big does it need to be in our life? A uh, great question. Um, you know, I, I know some pretty resilient people um, who I've met along the way, and I don't know how they got that way. Um, and I wonder, like, how in the world are you just do you keep dealing with this with such a positive attitude? Some people um, come to mind as I think about that. Um, and I try to model them because th they're, um, they're so able. Um, many of us are not quite wired that way and we do really need to focus on it. Um, and so I think to actually focus on um, what's this day gonna be like or what can I bring to this day or how can I take care of myself today or how can I connect with somebody unique who I haven't talked to this day um, and have ongoing questions with ourselves are, are really good or, or who, um, how am I gonna care about my parents today? Um, what, what, whatever those questions are, I think it's an ongoing internal dialogue that we can have with, with ourselves that's, uh, that's helpful. And I, I marvel at some people that I've known who are just able to actually um, be okay regardless of the situation. The rest of us, I think, have to practice. Well, you mentioned during the uh, discussion that, you know, when you have Zoom fatigue, there's some things you can do to try and, and manage that. And one of the questions we just received was, um, what might you do about um, battling when you have a child or, or maybe just a young adult who's starting to develop some addiction? To the screen. Do you have any resources that might be a little out of the um, scope here, but it kind of has to do with that Zoom fatigue. Yeah, it kind of depends on what the addiction to the screen is. Um, and I, um, so my association to that is, is that because kids can't get together right now, a lot of kids are get together like with video games because they can chat with each other while playing video games. Um, it's a way that they can play with one with each other um, and, and connect. And so um, what once looked like um, like a, a video game addiction is now for some kids really the only way to connect from, from their bedroom if they can't leave and go see friends. So it's really a complicated question that way um, in that people really do need to find ways to connect. And if it's facilitating for somebody and helps them feel connected, that's great. Um, if it feels, if it starts to seem um, like it's actually costing somebody psychologically something, then I think frank conversations are really important like 
um, you know what, you're on, you're on the screen all day long. Um, what else can we do? Um, let, let's, I know everything's closed. I know you can't see anybody, but let, let's just think about what else um, we can do right now um, uh, because we're at, at maybe the end of a pandemic and what are we gonna do to remember it? Um, what, what, what kind of activity can, can we share that we'll always remember we had during the pandemic? Or, or those are just some ideas. Um, I, don't, I don't know actual resources in terms of um, associations, um, in terms of, I mean, it kind of depends what addiction means here, I guess, in, the, in that context, because it can mean some pretty different things. Sure. Well, again, thank you for, for providing a, a bit of an answer on that. I think that we can absolutely get with um, Dr. Tone's department and other resources at UNM to help provide a, a resource for specific addictions for that question. So thank you for the question. And that does wrap up the questions that we have uh, in the chat, as well as the ones that we felt maybe quite weren't answered ahead of time during the lecture. So I want to thank you once again, Dr. Katzman, for uh, spending this time with us, for helping us with a successful community lecture series virtually. Uh, Dr. Toen, thank you so much for being here. And Dr. Silverblatt, thank you. Um, to the Advancement and Alumni team, I appreciate your efforts. Um, what a success. And to those who have watched and who are going to take this wonderful um, information, and we hope that you'll share it, but that you'll use it and that you'll be healthy as a result of it. Um, please do visit the School of Medicine's website and you'll be able to watch this again. The recording will be posted after the new year. And um, you know, as we end here, I do want to just thank the Academy and the City of Albuquerque for their partnership uh, with the School of Medicine in making these presentations possible. We hope to be able to continue to host these in person in the future. Thank you, Dr. Katzman, and thank you, Ashley, for managing this presentation. Thank you to the audience for being with us. Do look out for the, uh, the response summary that we'll be sending out via email to all of the registrants. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for, uh, for listening. And uh, I'm going to look forward, if, if there's a way that people can either chat in or um, ideas that they have or get those um, to us in some way, you know, I think we're, we're trying to build a repertoire here of how people do cope with a pandemic. And, um, and we're all living it, so we're all really becoming experts. And one day people will turn to us all and say, how did you survive that COVID-19? Yeah. Takes a village, Dr. Katzman. Yes. It does. Once again, thank you all. We hope you have a wonderful evening. <laughs>